Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to an, another session of our monthly live peripheral intervention case from Mount Sinai Hospital. Today, July 26, 2017, we come to you live at 8.02 in the morning, Eastern Standard Time. So before we head into PK for another live case, just to give you an update, please log on to our website, peripheralinterventions.org, to watch any of the previous cases in the archive section. You can also email us and, and click on the link for any questions while during this case or even afterwards for any questions, concerns, or comments. We would love to be in touch and answer anything we can from our side. So uh, without further ado, let me, well, let's go live to PK and see what he has in store for us. Good morning, PK. Hey, good morning, Vishal. Sorry for my weird outfit. Um, we were just using the, uh, the, what is it called, zero gravity again. But I wanted to talk to you about, we have a really a fantastic case. It was supposed to be one of our live cases for Link Mount Sinai, and uh, a patient couldn't come. Um, but I got to tell you, this is a really, really special case. Um, it's a very heavily calcified SFA with all the challenges that come with it and all the data. But before I get started, got a really uh, exciting announcement. We've got, our, we've got our new endovascular fellow, Dr. Sandeep Singla, who's joined us from the University of Miami, um, uh, excuse me, from, uh, from Mount Sinai uh, South Beach in Miami, and uh, Sandeep is to the right of me. We've got Elizabeth, our, our uh, endovascular nurse, uh, as well as Damien, our endovascular uh, technician, helping us. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Sandeep um, to present this uh, really, really challenging case. We'll go over some of the nuances in this case. Okay, good morning. Uh, so, uh, next slide. We have a 76-year-old man with a history of diabetes, hypertension, uh, coronary artery disease, uh, and uh, status post cabbage. Uh, he presented to us with the severe bilateral lower extremity claudication, Rutherford category 3, left more than right. On exam, uh, he is uh, hemodynamically stable. Next slide. His uh, pertinent labs, hemoglobin is 12.4, platelets are 146K, INR of 1.12, and creatinine of 0 0.68. Next slide. We had a non-invasive testing done on him. Uh, he essentially had an ABI of 0 0.40 on the uh, right, Liz, and uh, vessels were non-compressible on the left side, and his TBI on the left was 0 0.37. Next. So these are the images done in back in May, and uh, you know we had the left access. As you can see, there is almost a subtotal uh, occlusion of the right uh, uh, common femoral artery. At that point, the uh, patient underwent, we sent the patient for a right common fendra, femoral uh, endarterectomy with a patch angioplasty. Next. So this is the runoff on the left side. Uh, you can see there is some calcification in the common femoral and then uh, popcorn calcification in the uh, early segment of SF, uh, SFA. Next. This is the mid and distal segment. As you can see, heavy calcification and almost a subtotal occlusion in the just uh, before the, in, in the Hunter's Canal with the collateralization around it. Next. Popliteal is uh, without any significant disease. There is a two vessel runoff, as you can see, and uh, AT is occluded. Next. So really no significant disease below knee. Next. And this is the foot shot. Uh, we'll try to get better pictures today. But essentially, uh, PT is the dominant uh, vessel uh, in this image. Next. So the strategy we have for uh, this case is we have a right common femoral access. We already got a seven French uh, 45 centimeter uh, pinnacle uh, destination crossover sheath uh, cross. Uh, for lesion crossing, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Krishnan will go over different wire selections. We have, uh, you know, we got use distal protection, then uh, lesion preparation and definitive therapy. Uh, these are the two essential components we want to uh, discuss in this case. Next. So, you know, uh, I'll leave the uh, lesion crossing uh, uh, algorithm uh, with, uh, for Dr. Krishnan to kind of go over because there is no set protocol. And uh, But uh, uh, regarding embolic uh, protection device, there's a nice uh, paper based on a study of uh, 508 patients uh, from Mount Sinai lab uh, done at uh, uh, Dr. Krishnan. And uh, what essentially they gave us an algorithmic approach uh, when and uh, in which cases to use the filter. So I don't know if you guys can see it well, but uh, what it says is essentially if you have a heavy calcification and a lesion is uh, more than 40 millimeters, we go with a filter as we're gonna do in this case. Uh, and this uh, paper was published in uh, 
February uh, 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 2017 Jack Interventions. Next. So, so Sandeep, why don't you wait a little bit? Let's mm -hmm. talk a little bit on the case, and then we'll come back to the discussion. Okay. So, Vishal, I, I just want to go over well, some of the major salient points here. So, so you can see here, uh, before Sandeep gets to this presentation, so you can see here, as we, we went up and over, you can see the, the degree of calcification, and you saw the angiogram before, so which is pretty much unchanged. So basically, the, the patient has, has very, very severe popcorn-like calcium lesions within the vessel. Um, and, and you can see here by the runoff, the runoff is very, very slow. Um, so you can see here that if you see, there's really, even though it's, it looks uh, somewhat patent by the initial run, you can see that when you do the drug code, uh, I mean, when you see the, uh, the DSA pictures, you can see that the, uh, the actual vessel itself uh, has obstructive lesions with very, very slow filling uh, of, of, the, uh, of the vessel with really a popcorn-like lesion in the middle followed by single vessel runoff. So what we, in these kind of cases, one of the things that we've learned, uh, as you know very well, is basically that you probably going to need some sort of preparation of the vessel with some sort of, um, uh, what is it called? Um, okay. Uh, distal protection device. So you can see here, I tried to go with the with, with just a, the, the filter uh, wire itself, the Abbott Embershield wire, and we're not, it was not able to cross this. So now I'm using a directional catheter called the, uh, the, um, the, the trailblazer, the angle trailblazer, and I'm going to try to cross this with a, uh, with a fielder wire. Um, let me get a fielder wire, guys, and can I also get a confianza a and or a, a more difficult um, um, a high tip gauge wire. I want to show you one more thing here. If you look at this, this is how this is what was happening with our um, with our bare wire, uh, which is which is easy for the filter deployment. We were really trying to find there was really no channel for us to get through. So ideally speaking, we should use a Navi cross with an 035 system. But the problem with that is you may actually end this up dissecting the vessel. So so what we decided to do here is just go with a fielder first. And then try with a with a um, with a, uh, a stiff confianza type wire. What, what do you think? What are your thoughts, Vishal, in this situation? No, I think it's this is a very challenging case. I know we're used to all the SFA CTOs, and we think they take a lot of time. But these diffusely calcified lesions with this subtotal occlusion and different planes, and you know the cal eccentric calcification is actually more challenging than SFA CTOs. And in this case, like you rightly said. I would probably go for finding the channel and try to keep it as much luminal as possible. So using a hydrophilic system and especially a lower profile like an O14 and an O18 to begin with, I think is a great approach, especially with a support catheter. You do need a support catheter like you're doing, and especially with direction because you need to find that right plane and the support catheter with an angle is going to give you that advantage. Well, obviously, you know, the, there is a level of fenestration here. There has to be, and there it is. See that? So it just popped right. through. See, I think that's very important. When, when you have a hydrophilic wire and it pops through with fenestration, I think that's going to help you a lot um, because, you know, obviously the hydrophilic wire, it, it, you know, is going to find that alternative channel. And uh, I don't know why, you know, you know the Mount Sinai Cath Lab is uh, known to have all its equipment. And today, in our live case, we don't have our Terumo Navicross. So we gotta, we got to ask our, uh, you know, our, 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 our systems manager, you know, Willie, was actually phenomenal, uh, but today, for some reason, I think he fell asleep. Well, and I, we, we don't we don't have the uh, what we need. But anyway, well, I guess there's a different feeling when you're in zero gravity versus when you're at exactly. Earth. So, How'd you, you know, know this? Um, so anyway, so you can see how tight this is. This is not even crossing. Yeah, Look at this. The there you go. A little right bit there. of pull, a little bit of push, and now we're actually across. So now the question is, my is my uh, is my uh, what is it called? Bare wire or my. Uh, Filter are going to cross this. Is so, this so an 018 or an 014 uh, uh, trailblazer? This is an 018 trailblazer. Okay. But um, my my thought now was to put the filter filter down with the with the uh, uh, what is it called the, ne the what is the name of our filter the uh, Abbott Embo Shield, and then go ahead with the um, uh, with the pathway or the directional atherectomy. We're going to talk about what are the options. And I wanted to ask you now at this stage, what do you think? I mean, we we well, always talk talk about learning from our angiogram. And with the amount of difficulty that we had crossing with the Navi cross, do you think the Embo Shield will cross? No, first of all, we have to upsize because the bare wire has an 017 tip, so that's not a go. That's not going to go through this 014 catheter. It's so, 018. Oh, uh, okay. So if it's an 018, then I would still have. I'll still balloon a little bit, but I, like I said, the filter might not cross through that tight subtotal lesion. So 
Well, uh, we can give it a shot and see how it goes, but I think we might have to prep it up a little bit to make track for our balloons and everything going down. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I agree, and, and I think what I'm what I'm planning on do, what I'm hoping for is that the profile of the Amber Shield being, even though it's a little large, is it's going to give, and the metal uh, shaft is going to give us a little bit more pushability. Nice. First thing I'm going to do is try to take my bare wire and place it as far down the vessel as, as I possibly can. Uh, if I can do that, and in the posterior tibial, I'll be happy because that's our single contiguous, contiguous runoff to the foot. And obviously, I'm not able to, as always. Uh, there it goes. There okay. It I, I didn't give myself enough credit there. So now that I'm in the posterior tibial all the way down into the foot, I know that I've got a, a good amount of uh, purchase to be able to push to allow Sandeep to pull the wire back, you I know, was which I'm say. fully expecting with, all, with Farhan, that was always the case. But with Sandeep, I know that's not going to happen. Right, Sandeep? So, so, the, so, so the degree so, of placement of the wire is directly dependent on the fellow's confidence of pulling it back. I'm sorry? <laughs> just Go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry I, I missed that, Vishal. I was just going to say that the, the position of placement of the wire is directly dependent on the fellow's <laughs> ability to pull it back. Usually with Farhan, it was as far distal as we could get. Uh, with Sachin <laughs> and the other guys, was it was usually very, very reliable. So, so you know, you know how it is. You and I have dealt with this before. <laughs> so, the, so we're using the Ember Shield, which is off label here, over the barrel, barrel wire. So, what's it, so, so maybe Vishal, you can go over some of the advantages of the Ember Shield. Take off the torque, please. Right. So we use a lot of Ember Shield here at Mount Sinai, especially for cases like these. The advantage is it's 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 on the wire, but it's still independent of the wire, meaning that even if you oh, move the wire up and down. The filter itself does not move, so which gives us an advantage, especially in these calcified lesions where you have to push and pull and do a little bit of more manual labor that the wire would move. In addition to mm -hmm. the other filter system where the wire filter is on the attached to the wire, so it moves as and how the wire moves. So we don't want the whole purpose of filters to prevent distal embolization, and that's where this independent so-called status helps us to play. And the other thing is when I'm sure PK sh will show you probably down the lane is so we can still retain the wire and take the filter out. So it still keeps us the access across the lesion, whatever you worked in there, and without exchanging for a filter for another wire and then working on it. So it's a great device. Again, like PK said, it's off label, but uh, it works in handy in these cases. So we prefer it that way. As you can see, good luck. Not, not crossing. So give us a 3-0 yeah. corner balloon, guys. Yeah, that's the concern I had was the that tight uh, popcorn lesion you said, which is almost subtotal. That might give you a little bit of trouble getting things across. So, so this is part of the problem we have, Vishal, with this is that now we're, we balloon this, and then we're going to have to figure out whether to atherectomize it. So, so l let's l let's talk about the, the, the we're going to balloon this. So now, now what are the challenges in this lesion that you see? And I'll go over what I see. What are the challenges that you see? Well, I guess the biggest challenge is the degree of calcification and the extent. I mean, it's diffusely calcified. It's heavily calcified, almost like a 360 calcification. Uh, and so the whole thing is to prepare the vessel up for further treatment, either DCB or, if need be, stenting. So my thing would be to try to debulk as much as possible and to pre in, a, in, a, in, in order to prepare the lesion. So I would primarily go for atherectomy in this case for sure. So that would be my first step. And then decide on DCB with strength. and without stenting and how to see how it goes. So, I mean, what I do mean, you think? I, I personally, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, the challenge here is two, right? So, l let's break it down from a clinical, uh, from a t first, what are the clinical challenges and then what are the technical challenges? I think that's a very good approach for the, for our, for our interventionalists to think about this. So, so if you look at, if you look at the clinical challenges, well, well, first and foremost, the patient is a claudicant, right? Right. So, so you would like to give them as durable a result. Um, as you possibly can. Sandeep has prepared some, um, you know, little tidbits the way Sachin used to, um, and we kind of lost last year. But uh, <laughs> but the, uh, the can, can I have a, a, a goss, please? Uh, so so therefore, the, you know, the, if you want to give them a durable patency, you, we need to apply the data, right? Right. So when we need to apply the data, we need to figure out, okay, what you know, what is the best thing we can do? So I won't, without stealing, um, you know, um, um, Sandeep's thunder. Uh, as we know, the data is going to be presented. It's not all that you know, encouraging and, and, um, and how can you say, satisfying. So that's the clinical challenge. Technical challenge-wise, go ahead, go scene minus, go, go one minus. So technical challenge-wise, okay, it's the one below, huh? It's around 26. So 26 is where I couldn't cross. Show me above. Yep, this is pretty much it. Yeah, already crossed, yeah. Uh, yep, it's right about here. Okay. So, so technical challenge-wise is everything you said. One is... 
what is the what what is the definitive therapy here? Go up. Okay. Well, we know that that we need to we need to debulk this lesion. Why? Okay. Go to twenty. So why is that happening? Down. Well, we need to we need to debulk this lesion because go up here to twenty because we need to deliver therapy. So so w whether that therapy is with 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 a stent. Well, we need to get act, uh, have maximal stent expansion, right? right? So, so one option could be is to serial balloon this, uh, with, with saying to yourself that, hey, you know what? I'm going to serial balloon this. I'm going to stent this no matter what. I know that. You know that. So why are we bothering with this atherectomy stuff? The other option is to say, hey, listen, I'd like to do atherectomy, and 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 do a biological therapy. And we'll talk. Some people talk a little bit about what is the data available on the biological therapy. Okay, there is, so there's very limited data with that. But the option there is to say to yourself, hey, you know what, this, in this challenging subset of lesions, down, I know that my clinical results are not the best. So therefore, therefore, I, I, I don't want to burn bridges to future therapy. So therefore, I'd like to leave a biological, uh, you know, uh, the best biological therapy that I have at this time, based on what data that I have at this time, and then, and then be able to, with full knowledge, that I'm going to have to come back and treat this at some other time. So, so, so in, in my opinion, those are the challenges. So the second thing is, well, well what, what if the patient, what can go wrong with this patient? Well, one, you can embolize this during therapy, convert him from um, a, a claudic into a critical limb ischemia. Two, you can perforate the vessel and have to put a, put a, put a, 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 a stent in, uh, like a coverage stent, which is not negative. There's data with that. However, it's not ideal in a single vessel runoff patient. So, so therefore, you have to consider these technical aspects before you start. So now that we've, you and I have kind of gone, gone over what, what we would do, I'm going to ask uh, our good friend Sandeep to go ahead and present uh, some of what, what data that he's performed. The idea about the filter is I wanted to just express what Sandeep was trying to express, is that <clears throat> at this stage, nobody knows where to use a filter and where not to use a filter. So you and I had discussed this in the past, and we looked at the data at Sinai, and, 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 and we looked at which data, uh, which area where filters fit, and which areas filters don't. I can't, ah, oh, there we go. Thank God I got it through that. So, so in our data, was very, very clear, at least in this, in this, in this subset of patients, severely calcified patients, you, with, with lesions greater than, uh, you know, four centimeters, you clearly, clearly need to have a filter. And also popcorn types of lesions, you need to have a filter. So I think because your, your adverse events in terms of embolization, vessel loss were too high with, 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 without the use of a filter. So yes, you're adding cost, but now for the first time, you know that you have clinical benefit, and you also know that, that, that there is benefit regarding um, what's it called, uh, the use of the filter in, 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 in preventing adverse outcomes uh, for the patient with loss of vessel runoff. So, so I, that thing is for clear, and I encourage everybody to read that paper and use that paper in your practice because we've done that with thousands of patients. We, put, we presented 500, but we've done that with thousands of patients. It seems to work very well. So while I prepare the IVIS and go through with the IVIS, I'm going to have Sandeep just go through the rest of the slides, and then we'll talk a little bit about the data. Sandeep? Yeah. Awesome. So, uh, you know, Dr. Krishnan and uh, Dr. Kapoor, they kind of addressed the initial two uh, big questions. Uh, you know, lesion crossing and uh, when to use the embolic protection. So those two things are done as we move along the case. Now the question becomes is the lesion preparation and the definitive therapy. So what I did was kind of looked at the, you know, data which has been gathered over the last 30 years and uh, the basic approaches. So as you can mm. see in this slide, you know, it's a comparison between uh, using a bare uh, first generation stents and the plain angioplasty. And uh, definitely plain angioplasty does not seem to hold uh, good especially with longer lesions and after 12 months. You know, bare uh, stents, uh, we didn't have an option before, so they were used, but they are not still not as good results as the therapies we have today. Next slide. With the current modalities, uh, uh, yeah, please stay on this. Uh, w what, we have, what we have is a uh, drug-coated balloon therapy and uh, called the biological therapy, and then uh, interwoven stent, uh, the supera stent, which uh, really has uh, expanded the realm of uh, intervention in the SFA, and we can address the long lesions uh, there. Record, Ivis, please. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you look at uh, the two big trials, uh, the one is the impact SFA and the superb, uh, the impact SFA was the admiral, uh, this, uh, the uh, Medtronic uh, drug-coated balloon. They had a, a very uh, excellent uh, one-year potency of uh, almost 90% uh, and uh, with impact and uh, similar potency with this uh, superb trial. Next. 
But coming to the re uh, real world experience, you know, like when you address all the lesions uh, with heavily uh, calcified diabetic patients, uh, uh, the data, there is data from Leipzig uh, registry, next, that suggests that, uh, you know, the drug-coated uh, therapy uh, does not hold as good as the Supera. Okay, next. But uh, there is uh, the, there's a, another uh, drug-coated balloon uh, uh, which is a stellar X balloon, and there are two uh, arms to this trial. One is a European uh, trial, and one is the uh, US uh, trial. Uh, and the results of the European trial were recently published in the uh, CERC. Uh, and then the, uh, the US uh, results uh, will be presented re uh, in the soon. Next. So the big point which I wanted to highlight uh, between uh, uh, the three uh, uh, drug-coated balloon therapies which are uh, in the practice in the contemporary world uh, as you can see that, uh, you know, the lesion calcific uh, the subset of patients with lesion calcification was only uh, 8 to 12 percent in uh, the Lutonic trial in PACT and the European arm of the Illuminate trial. In comparison, the Illuminate uh, U.S. pivotal trial, almost 50 percent of the patients had uh, lesion calcification. Next. So uh, what that, uh, go back one slide, please. So what it essentially tells us is that, you know, even though uh, with the superb tr uh, trial comparing it to in, uh, impact uh, SFA, nice. we did not have as durable results with the impact in the impact SFA, but with this uh, new uh, balloon, mm -hmm. uh, the potency was 82 percent even in the heavily calcified the lesions. Okay, next. Now in our lab, you know, we use uh, directional atherectomy in, uh, as a lesion preparation in. Uh, very frequently, and uh, the question, there is a trial going on which is uh, addressing that uh, whether doing a directional atherectomy uh, proceed, uh, before uh, drug-coated balloon therapy, does that add any uh, significance to the potency, uh, 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 to the durability of the results? So and in this uh, trial, there is an arm which is uh, specifically addressing the heavily calcified lesion, as you can see. Uh, is, this is a dot trial. Next. And uh, even though not as uh, durable as uh, superb uh, results, uh, in this, uh, in the prelim data suggests that uh, there is a potency of almost uh, a 12 month potency is almost 70% uh, even in heavily calcified uh, lesions with an approach of uh, directional atherectomy preceding the drug coated balloon in uh, calcified lesion. Next. So, Sandeep, uh -huh. hold, hold on a second. Can you go back to the beginning, guys? I, th I think I a think couple of things that we need to clarify. Go to the beginning of his slide set. Go all the way to the beginning. So, so I, 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 th I think, you know, it's, it's a challenge when, you know, Sandeep is new, he's here, no, not here, plus one. And, and we're trying to present, uh, you know, this complex type of data and, and kind of understand how the randomized control data and the available data addresses uh, the question at hand. So, so what, when, when we look at, when you look at options on, on, on drug-coated therapy and what are the options available for the treatment of SFA, I think this slide Sandeep was trying to say is that very, very clear that, no, I need that still. It, it was, no, don't worry about that. It's going to be fine. Then quickly redo it, please. Then uh, what's it called? One of the things that, uh, that, 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 that you have to understand is that bare metal, a bare metal stent is superior to PTA in SFA. Okay, Schillinger and Associates showed this. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's shown in multiple, multiple clinical trials as illustrated by, 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 the, by the study. Basically, Viabon stenting, bare metal stenting, some sort of stenting is better in the SFA than not. And okay, that's the first concept. Second, so, so what, 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 go to the next slide. So when you start looking at modalities for SFA popliteal lesions, you, 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 if you want to compare stenting to balloon, the, to drug-coated balloon, there is no head-to-head -head randomized control trial. So all you can do is extrapolate from the studies that are available. So when you look at the studies that are available, what are the level one evidence studies that are available? Well, level one evidence is basically the, uh, the, the, the drug-coated balloon uh, uh, trials that are available, which compared uh, DCB, the impact DCB, the Stellarex DCB, and the Lutonix DCB uh, to, to standard PTA. In these lesions, in, in, in intermediate lesion, anywhere from uh, 5.7 to about 8.9 centimeter lesions, DCB was superior to PTA in these lesions at 12 months for sure. The impact balloon has out to three year data um, that's been presented and is going to be published, which shows that the impact balloon is superior to PTA at three years. There is no head-to-head -head data when you compare drug-coated balloons to stents, zero. 
there is independent data from the Zilver PTX trial that showed that DES is superior to optimal PTA and provisional BMS um, in, in out to five years with the Zilver PTX randomized controlled trial. There are multiple registries that clearly show that, that there are patencies of, of the superistent is, is, is demonstrated out to three years, but these are not randomized controlled trials. So, so right now, your options in, in the SFA are going to be drug-coated balloons, drug-coated uh, drug stents, uh, what's it called, bare, bare metal or, or, or bare metal stents, meaning, you know, um, nitinol stainless steel laser cut stents, and or, uh, uh, what is it called, supera, uh, what is it called, biomimetic stents, and also atherectomy. So now the question comes is, if you take the SFA as a whole and say, well, this is where we're at, well, what happens when the SFA is calcified? These lesions weren't studied. Well, how are we going to know what to do in this particular patient? Next, please. Next slide. Okay, so, so, so this is basically talking about supera in calcific lesions. So what are the problems with calcific lesions? Well, one is success of the procedure. Two is whether or not you're going to be able to place a, a stent and, and expand the stent, okay? So in Leipzig, uh, Scheinert, our good friend Dirk Scheinert and, and Andre Schmidt and colleagues showed that the supero stent was effective in, in, in these calcified complex lesions as long as they were deployed properly. So what does deployed properly mean? Well, one is that there should be no stent elongation because elongation was the, was the worst predictor of patency of these stents. Second, if, they, if, if, they, if they're treated non, if they're placed nominally, meaning a 150 length is placed as a 150 length, then, the, then these stents were patent out, out to three years with low TLR rates and resinosis rates. That's the take home point. So Supera becomes an option without level one randomized control data, which is not available in this lesion subset to treat these lesions. Next please, next slide. So again, again this is their, their, their uh, what is it, what, what do they call it? propensity matched analysis that was presented about two or three years ago in Leipzig. Again, data that's, I don't necessarily know, I don't know where this was published. Uh, I'm not certain where it was published. It was presented, I think it was published somewhere. Um, I don't know if it was CERC or not, but it was published somewhere. However, I don't think it was published in CERC. But however, the, the point here was they showed in, in, in by propensity matching for demographics, lesion length, you know, clinical characteristic, that Supero was superior to DCB and, and, and superior to BMS at, uh, what, 60 months or 40, 40, 42 months. So, so therefore, you can see that there has, there's some data suggesting that a scaffolding type therapy with Supera may be superior to a biologic therapy. However, by no means can you make a clinical decision just based on the study. Next, please. So, so what do the drug-coated balloon trials show? Well, first and foremost, I think the first disclaimer is you cannot, uh, these types of lesions were excluded from most drug-coated balloon trials. Second, the definition of calcium was different in all the drug-coated balloon trials. So if you look at the impact SFA of the Lutonix uh, uh, um, uh, 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 trial and, or, and the Stelrex trial, they all use different definitions of calcium. With the Lutonix study, we don't know their definition. I, as far as I know, they haven't released it. With the impact, it, it was defined as greater than five centimeters on either side of the vessel wall, okay? Was defined as severe calcium. And by, by, the, by the Stellarex trial, which I was a national PI, we was greater than one centimeter, but it had to be circumferential. Two things you need to understand about calcium and drug-coated balloons. Finelli's data, which you've all seen showing the CT and the arc of calcium, clearly showed that circumferential calcium was the, was the, was the highest predictor of failure of drug-coated balloons. And he postulated very eloquently that this could be because of either recoil or this could be because of lack of penetration of the drug. So if you just say take drug-coated balloon trials, well, we know with the impact SFA and the Lutonix, they haven't been studying the randomized control trial using their definition because by using their definition, they, they, their calcified lesions was a very low uh, preponderance of, of patients in their study. The Stellarex trial had, had a higher preponderance because po possibly because they used a different definition of calcium. And currently, I'm sure all the companies are looking at their data based on both both uh, definitions and to see what their outcomes are. So currently the only drug-coated balloon that studied by de in their definition severe calcium is the Stellarex. Next please. So, so if, you look at, if you look at the Stellarex uh, trials uh, and you compare it to the impact in Lutonix, which you really can't compare, can't compare a Keros randomized controlled trials. One thing I'll tell you is all of them work. So my take home from this slide is DCBs work. That's it, period. Next please. So, so, so if DCBs work, and Stellarex says, you know, has some data that says in its definition it works. Well, 
wh what is the value of doing atherectomy in these lesions? And will atherectomy in these lesions, would it help us if we believe Finelli's uh, theory that calcium is not able to get into the vessel wall because of the circumferential arc of calcium? So the definitive AR study was a pilot study done by uh, Tom Zeller. I think it's been recently published. I don't know where. Um, and, and, and Tom really looked at whether or not using these very, very complex lesions, whether having what we call as dark therapy, which is directional atherectomy combined with anti retinotic therapy, is going to help us achieve better outcomes in these lesions. So this was very, very nice. So they looked at two arms where, where, where they looked at DART versus DCB in lesions that were not severely calcified. And they looked at a single arm where they looked at DART, which is obviously direct atherectomy with anti retinotic therapy with in severe calcified lesions, kind of like the ones we're doing today. Next, please. So what they found was there was no difference in all patients. But there seemed to be a trend in more complex patients. And you really can't make it much out of this. If you look at this, you can't say one's better than the other. What you can say is, hey, you know what? It's kind of interesting that in, in regular patients, it didn't seem to make a difference. So maybe DCB is all you need in the vanilla lesion. But in the real lesions, maybe you, you're going to need uh, you know, some sort of you know, adjunctive therapy like directional atherectomy. Next, please. So, 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 so what, what, what's some data with, with drug-coated stents? So we talked about Supera, we talked about drug-coated balloons, we talked about DART, now what about drug-coated stents? Now, these lesions were not in the actual drug-coated stent trial called the, uh, um, the Zilver PTX study. But, but in, their, in, their, in their Japanese uh, PMA, this is not what I want to show. Next, please. This is about surgical bypass. We'll come to this. In the Japanese PMA, did you show that? Did you put that up? Oh, you didn't show that. So, so go one, one back, please. In the Japanese PMA, they actually studied heavily, heavily calcified lesions such as this with zero vessel runoff. And it showed that Zilver PTX is very, very effective in renal failure patients or more effective in renal failure, failure patients and in patients with severe calcification um, than, than bare metal stent, than bare metal Zilver compared to their own stent. So therefore, drug-coated balloons, uh, drug-coated stents are an option in these patients. Number two, if you look at what about surgical options, it's always important to talk about surgical options. So in surgical options, this was the Silver Pass study, which was presented by our good friend Cohen DeLuce, both in our conference as well as in Leipzig last year. And, and he looked at one-to-one -one randomization of 220 patients with TAS-C and D patients, lesions which were eligible for surgical therapy. So they compared Silver PTX to PTFE bypass. Next, please. So what they found was that Zilver PTX is more effective than, than PTFE bypass. So therefore, if this patient does not have a favorable vein, and, and therefore you're going to have to go with PTFE, it may be reasonable to use drug-coated stents in these long surgical lesions, because these lesion lengths were quite long, similar, similar to what we were dealing with here. Right? That was, yeah. That's the point. Next, please. That, no, finish. Okay, that's yeah. it. So, 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 so now we've gone over all the data that's available, and now we need to make a decision. So what's ongoing in, in America? Well, we have uh, Krishna Roka Singh and our, uh, our good friends, uh, both Roka Singh and Brian D. Robertis, are running a wonderful study sponsored by the Viva Group called the Reality Study. And what the Reality Study is, is studying is whether or not directional atherectomy with IVUS is going to help us in, uh, to, to have a better result with, uh, with drug-coated balloons. It's a single arm registry. It's a single arm study, core lab adjudicated, multi-center. We're fortunate enough to be one of the centers participating in this. So, so, so this is the kind of lesion where we don't know if drug-coated balloons work. Okay? We don't know whether we need to do adjunctive therapy. Okay? We know that, that, that the long stents do work in some registries like we talked about, and also in Zilva, Zilva Pass, it's encouraging results. But the point is whether or not drug-coated balloons fit okay, in this lesion. So, so at this stage, what, what, we, what, what are the options if you decide to do a drug-coated balloon? Well, if you believe Finelli's data, you know that the drug-coated balloon alone is not going to be effective here. So if you need to do an atherectomy, what are the options? So Vishal, I mean, we're going to talk about directional atherectomy, obviously, but, but what, are the, what are the other atherectomy options here? And I'm sorry for that long-winded discussion. No, that was an awesome discussion for going over the data and the options we have. I guess the good news is we have so many options. The bad news is we don't know where, which is better than the other because there is no, like you said, head-to-head -head trials between the different arms. So talking about this patient, I mean, again, we have multiple options on the table. Is which, uh, which suits better for this one? I mean, you could decide if it's you want to do directional atherectomy, you want to do orbital atherectomy, or you want to do uh, atherectomy with aspiration, which is the, uh, the jet stream. So in this case, personally, if I was there, 
and because it's a long, cal heavily calcified lesions, I would probably opt for either a orbital atherectomy, which is the CSI, or the jet stream pathway, because that will take care of the diffuse calcification lesions. I would not tilt over the directional atherectomy, specifically in this heavily calcified well, lesions. Well, you're absolutely right, and I got to tell you, well, the, 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 the initial thought for us was to do pathway, but, I, but I'm, I'm starting to lean towards uh, uh, directional, I'll show you why, because we did IVIS. Can you please play the IVIS, uh, Damien? So when, when you play the IVIS, and I want to show you the IVIS on what we did, so, so the IVIS will show you exactly the areas. Oh, you didn't record it? You, you did record it. Okay. I was just going to say, what happened to my IVIS? Huh? It got lost? Aha. Look at Damien. Isn't he awesome? Yep. All right. Here we go. Aha. They didn't record it. Is it not? Wait, we did record it, I thought. No? Little friend. Yep, that's it. No, nope, they didn't record it. Okay, let's do the IVIS again. And again, this is part of the uh, the issues. Like, I was used to this when Farhan was here. It always used to happen to me. Oh, there it is. There it is. Okay, so you can see distal to proximal. You can see that there's very, very little plaque burden. And then as you start coming up over Charlotte, see, you've got eccentric calcification, but really nothing much within the lumen. So, so, so when you see coming up, you see it's all calcium, but it's really external calcium, and there's some calcium pulling back into the lumen. So right there, you have a heavy plaque right there with some calcium right in the proximal edge. And, and then you can see as you come back, you start getting into more just external calcification. So, so to me, if you, if you look at, go scene minus for me, Baya. So I, I, if you see scene minus here, and I, I focused on the areas, there's the IVIS going down plus. So this is the first area of severe blockage right there, where we have the calcium that's really compressing the vessel. Next, please. Minus. Yep. That's the second area, again, with calcium compressing the vessel. Next, please. And that's the third area. So to me, you don't have this popcorn calcium, even though you think there is popcorn calcium within the vessel. The calcium seems to be compressive with some minimal plaque. So for those reasons, I'm going to use directional atherectomy. Can you open the directional atherectomy, please? Well, I guess the issue I have is if you look at Finelli's data, this technically falls into that 270 degree plus calcification. Yes. You can see it. Yes. So we have to, I mean, not that we cannot use directional, we just have to do good, long, prolonged cuts, like really good quadrant cuts to give us a you good result. So I think that's the only thing with directional. If you're good at it, yep. yes, that's if a it's, a, it's a controlled atherectomy, but you have to have good four plane, four quadrant, maybe even more quadrant cuts to get good results to start doing your further treatment of options. So if, if you're not used to doing directional atherectomy, yeah. I would recommend people to do orbital or the other, the jet stream, because you that has, uh, that can it? really cut circumferentially and not you don't have to really direct your vessel, in, uh, direct your device in one way or the other. So well, you know, you know, I, experience I, I, adds on, of course. So right, yes. I, I think the answer, is, the answer is we don't know what's the right. most optimal atherectomy here, right? So, so, so what I'm going to do here is just go ahead, and you can see the, how disrupted that, that vessel is. I'm just going to go ahead and do directional because I think that for, at this stage, we really don't know what's the optimal atherectomy. Obviously, I think that CS, I think more than CSI, in my opinion, in this case, it, it clearly, uh, for me, the, the pathway uh, is, is a more uh, better directional atherectomy uh, than, than the CSI for this type of case. But here I'm going to go with, uh, with this, the, the lesion lengths that are allowed in this particular uh, 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 study is up, out to 180. So, so, so the current lesion that we're going to go is from 31, go, go scene minus three, tw twice, please. I'll tell you right now, I, I, I just did. So minus, so minus, so that's what, 19. So basically 19 to minus, 19 to 31, but I'm going to go from 35 to to what, 35, if I go from 35 to 10, that's what? That's yeah. 20, right? Yeah. That's 25. 25. 25. That's too much. So hold on, don't open it. It may not, be, may not even qualify. So if I go from, let me take another picture. So again, for, with these randomized trials, the problem is, is it gonna qualify? Let me see. Mm -hmm. Hold on, let me tell you right now. Inject. Inject. I just wanna see whether it's gonna qualify because I'm gonna go, have to go from 10, to 34, 35, it's not yeah. going to qualify. All right, it's not going to qualify. So then, you know what, I'm just going to use the pathway then. Give me the pathway. So we're going to use the pathway. 
we'll listen to you, Vishal, and if it doesn't work out, we'll talk later. Oh, yeah. Hopefully it'll work out. Okay. I guess just to add on to the jumble of trials we presented in the options, I'm pretty much excited about the new it's lithoplasty, the shockwave oh, disrupt trial, which should add on to our armamentarium of using atherectomy devices. So that should, again, be something we look forward to in the coming year or so. That should be great. So, so, so what I can tell you is, so we're going to test the pathway. I know a lot of you are wondering where Ray is. Ray's, uh, Ray's you know, had a, had a family issue, and he's at home. And uh, so, therefore, we're now going to test all this without Ray. So, uh, go ahead, guys. Hit the button. Where's the... Where'd it go? Turn it upside down. It's oh, right there. It's here. Yeah. I don't know why this thing is now. Your wires are looped around. Okay. Let's just load the wire. Let's watch that thing for me so you don't have to clean it up again. Yeah, so it's pretty much like how a rotoblader in Cornier works. You just mm -hmm. have to snap the wire here. It's like the brakes. I know. Right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Press the button. Press the button. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not working. No, it is. You can no, see it aspirating. Yeah. How come I don't hear a spin? You should see it. This is just a fluid coming. There's no spin? There's no spin. No. What's going on? Is it working? I don't know, we're having a little technical issue here. We'll have Damien scrub in and see what he says. To me, it should, to me, I remember it spinning. Yes. When we test and it's not spinning. Nope, not spinning. So it's not winning in any yes, mode, either the Rex spinning. mode or the regular mode. Oh, you didn't even prime it before. It should still spin. Oh, I see. I mean, you can see it aspirating, but it's not turning, right? Only the aspiration part is working, not the blade part. But I believe it's not primed yet. That's the reason. Once it's primed, it'll spin. It's priming still? You might have to. Okay, we're ready. So now that we, uh, we, did, we did this, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna feed this through and then I'm gonna have I'm gonna have him push it forward, and uh, we'll work it out at that time. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have to spin from 11 all, all the way down, um, and then I'm gonna go ahead balloon it, and then I'm gonna go ahead and uh, and um, and then decide what to do. So we're gonna go ahead now, and I know that uh, uh, Nick Shamas is also working on a trial for this particular one here. Come over here. So watch out for that. Uh, just, you can just advance that. Nick, Nick's, no, no, no. Nick's also working on a particular trial that's, got, that, that's looking at pathway with, uh, with the range of DCB, I believe, and that's not quite started for the same particular reason, sort of like a reality for pathway. So what we're going to do is we're going to advance this. So before this, I want to tell everybody at home, look at where your distal wire is. Make sure your distal wire is distal, which it is, because, you know, it's a very, very bulky device. This is part of the advantage of this particular particular device. So go ahead, advance. So PK, do you do, you do any vessel preparation by giving some uh, vasodilators before you go in? Is there I know any a lot of people do all that. I don't do all that, Vishal. Push, it's going to be hard, yeah. Yes. I don't do all that. I really just believe that meticulous technique with the pathway device is what's going to work here. Can you take it all the way to 10? Keep coming down, I'll tell you where. That's it. Keep going, right there, right there, good. So now what you do is, so I mean, people do all that. They put, you know, stuff in the bag and all that nonsense. And so what I want you to do is you have, you have, um, 
Which one is blades up? I'm trying to think. Yeah, that. So that you right press this button first yes. for blades down, and then when, you, when I tell you to press blades up, you press this and then press that. Okay, so okay we'll work start. together. Focus. Yeah. Do I so what I'm going to do first is, as we get the pathway down, no, you don't do anything except that. Just this. Yeah. And then I'm going to I'm going to help and you. And here. This and this. So okay. I'm going to show you, make sure our wire is still kosher, uh, which it is, which I'm very happy with. So now I'm going to come back and we're going to start this process here. So the key here is just a packing motion. Ready? On. You got to hold it. Make sure your wire is locked from the back. Huh? The wire should be locked from the back. I can't see yep, it. Yep, yep. The it wire is locked or else it won't activate. Right. Off, please. Now blades up. That button. On. So you can see under the blades up mode, it's going to go very slow. You got, you got to really keep slow movements. You can see it stops moving there because that's the area of the vessel with a lot of calcium. And you know, you know we're embolizing right here, guys. You know it. Right. It's happening as we speak. Off. Now you want to go to the next button, next area of scene, uh, show me the IVIS pictures. So one was around 10, 9. Next, minus. The blades down. Minus. Minus. Okay, that was, that's the first one is around, okay, minus. Okay, so f minus, plus, go plus one. So plus, okay, so it's around 15, 19, okay. Right here. Blades, blades down? Blades down. Go. Very small motion. There's the eccentric calcium there. Yeah, you're right. You can see how the the, uh, the blade itself behave, and that can give you an idea whether you're in the lesion or off well, the Well, that's lesion. what's embolizing, Vishal, right, right now. It's supposed to aspirate, but you and I know it's not aspirating that much off. Blades up. Blades up. Go. Go. See how it just worked through that calcium? Right. Very slow. Yeah. Off. Okay, show me the third, second one. The third one I mean was 25, right? Mm -hmm. Minus. Okay, that one we did, minus. That one, tw no, wait, wait, plus. So this is what, 24 plus? And then uh, you're going minus. And 31, okay, 24 yeah. and 31. On, blades up, just go blades up. Blades up. Mm -hmm. Go. You can see the deceleration there. Yep. Ah, lots here. Right there. Lots of stuff here. Off. Blades down. Blades down. Go. Yep. Let it work through that. Off. Okay, blades down. Blades down. Go. This the air is really bad. Yeah, it's just slow, short segment moves. Off. It's the most uh, safest way to do an apterectomy in this case. So. The beauty of this device is you can go down and up with the pathway. Off. Okay, let me see what my wire is again. I always like to check my wire in these complex lesions. Wires came back a little bit, just as we thought. Try to push it forward. Okay, good. That's fine. Come back up. Always comes back a little bit. Uh, go ahead, blades up now. Blades up. Go. Right there. Uh. I can't wait to see my filter. <laughs> this is like Christmas morning for me. Oh, that is tight. This is what I tell people, you're always embolizing. 
And they don't get it. Now we got it. We got it. Oh. Yeah, over. Off. Can I hit Rex for me, my friend? Now we cannot move this filter. Rex. And you'll see why. When I tell you to hit Rex, you hit Rex. Okay. Um, Okay, Rex. So you always want to come out on Rex. Yes. Go ahead. You're, you're good. Yeah, it's, not good. It's, it's just that arch of the ilium. Yep. That's when yep. it gets stuck, all this. My zero gravity is limiting me here off. Okay. Now let's take a mag up on the filter to show everybody how much debris we have. I think this is one of the very good techniques which one should do at their place is mag up to an angle to really see how bad the filter is because you might underestimate, but like you rightly said, there would be a lot of grub and then you might end up in trouble if you don't retrieve well, it in the I, right I way. I would be shocked if they're slowing this vessel right now. As you can see. Me too, yeah. As you can see. And the moment of truth. Well, it's already past the moment of truth. We're not having anything come down. Question is, did we perf so bad that everything's in the thigh? No. He has no pain. See? Look at that. Look at the flow. Woohoo, baby. There it is. It's so slow. There it is. Somehow it's coming down. Ready? Let's do a DSA. Oh, one second. One second. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Take your time. There's your filter full of junk. You see it now? The problem is we didn't cover our AT, but thank God it's closed. All right, so give me the uh, give me the penumbra now, guys. So you know, so so what we're gonna do is we're gonna aspirate this with the penumbra. I think so. Well, I would. There's no reason to rush. Yeah, you can. You want penumbra. I think so. So what would happen if we use their own retrieval device but do not completely collapse the filter? We just close the neck off and then take it off. Would that not work? I think you could try. You but, but the only reason is you lose wire access in that case. Because no, you have to pull no, it off. No, you wouldn't lose wire access. You wouldn't have to. Okay. Yeah, you you wouldn't have to use the you wouldn't have to use the loose wire access. I think in this situation, I'm just flushing it now while they get everything in here. Right. Uh, but I think I think I'm very happy with this lesion right now. The way it's expanded, I think we've really made an impact on the uh, on the vessel dynamic here. I just want to really. Analyze. So what's your next thought process? Would you go back to Ivis? I just want to analyze this filter a little more if I can. Let me just flush it down. See, this is where the advantage of being on bivalve rudin is also going to help you. You know, so right now I'm just going to go ahead and now I'm going to go, I'm just flushing it to give my microvasculature a lot of, a lot of uh, fluid. Now I'm going to go down with this. Open the tube, please. Mm -hmm. Press the button. Yep. Okay, I'll take it off then. Okay, feed it through. Don't pull the wire, please. Yeah. So, what are you using? A, if you can show us, are you using a guide? Are you using? I'm just arm? using a multi-purpose guide, Vishal. Okay. A six French. Well, don't attach, please, right now. Uh, I'll pull the wire. I'm just using a six French multi-purpose guide. Rail, rail the wire. Put me on coronary, please. Rail the wire. Rail the wire, please. Pull the wire. I'll tell you, I've got the distal end. The rail the wire, nice. Thank you. So the key here is also, at this stage, just your, your worry right now is the filter, you know? Correct. Your worry is the filter. You cannot have this filter move. Everything else is all, it's, it's not an issue for you. I don't want everybody at home to worry about where my penumbra is going or where my multipurpose guide is going. So the, the thing I teach uh, Sandeep all the time, if that wire moves, he's not doing a good job. So I'll show you when he's not doing a good job and when he's doing a good job. See how rail that is? How straight that is? That means that that, that is moving, that, that it's, he's actually doing a wonderful wonderful job of railing. The moment that thing starts to move, starts to buckle, that's okay, this is normal motion through the vessel. But the moment that that starts, so now I'm having a little bit of resistance, mm -hmm. 
can I just get a syringe? So what I'm going to do is just put a syringe at this area to prevent excess of bleeding. And what I want to do is I just want to go to the area where we're having resistance. And that's the idea of going with the multipurpose catheter, right? You can always torque it, right? So I'm just going to, I'm just going to pull it back a little bit, right? And that's where your dense calcification was, right? Yeah, there is dense calcification. Let me see if that works. That's not working. And I, okay, I think I twisted my, uh, my multipurpose here. So it might be worthwhile to balloon this before we take the, anything down to aspirate. All right, guys, so I'm going to do that. Give me a new multipurpose. Give me a 60200 or long uh, 018 balloon. Walk this out carefully. Don't pull the wire. Let me just do it myself. Yep. Yeah. So you can see these complex lesions involve a lot of steps. So, you know, this Avid filter is so phenomenal. It just stays there, doesn't move. As long as you don't allow it to move, you're fine. Give me a new multipurpose. I, I, I twisted it. <coughs> so, so you have to assume at this stage this filter is full. Okay, give, can you give that? Give me the thing, please. Give me the, the balloon. When you guys are prepping the balloon, you hand the balloon to me, and then you prep the balloon. Thank you, Damien. Let's go. So I'm gonna. I already know I've, I've treated this with a with a regular balloon. I mean with uh, atherectomy. So at this stage now I'm gonna balloon this. I'm gonna go from about, I'd say nine rail. Okay, I want you to rail, please. Don't bend the wire, please. I would just go from five all the way back up and then just. Well, let's see, because remember you had that second lesion all the way up top, right? right? That, that we had trouble with, which we didn't see it on Ivis, but the pathway certainly didn't go through very smoothly. Good. This is kind of where I want to be. All right, go up, guys. So the fact that the multipurpose guide did not go down is, is concerning. Yeah, there's another trick to that. Come forward, which is to use an 035 wire next to it. Going up with the balloon loose. There Crack it, it is. Crack it. Hopefully the compliance has changed with this pathway that we just did. Yeah. Okay. Seems to looks like it's changing. Crack it, please. Problem with this balloon, guys. Okay, that's good. That's enough. Problem with this balloon is if this balloon ruptures, you have to be very, very careful that it doesn't infold on itself, especially in calcified lesions. This is where the uh, the, the Kevlar balloon from Bard um, is it works a lot better than these uh, regular flimsy balloons from other companies. And, uh, and this particular balloon is a very effective balloon and has a very good crossing profile, but however, as an O1A balloon is limited by, uh, and the reason for its good crossing profile is that it's not a very bulky balloon. So if, you, if you're going to go to high pressures with these balloons, when you do rupture, which will eventually happen, clearly let the balloon deflate before you pull the balloon back, because then it'll infold on itself and make it very, very difficult to take out. Down, please. Or impossible. So, what, so now that we've inflated very, very well, I just want to know the, so I don't have geographic miss. I'm from about, what, 8 or 9 up to, say, 16 17, yeah. or 17. 9 to 16, we're going to have to DCB or DES, whatever we decide to do. So now that uh, we're going to walk this balloon out, and hopefully then we can try taking another picture. Again, again, I'm going to focus on my filter again, because this is where all my money is. This is the bank that has all my money right now. Which is not much, by the way. I have to talk to Sharma about my contract. So, <laughs> God, walk that out. Be careful. Watch the filter. Give me the new multipurpose, guys. Let's see. Okay, great. Mm-hmm. So now I'm going to go in with the new multipurpose, right? And uh, once the wire comes out, they'll add the, the uh, TUI to it. So, so far, we're about exactly 55 minutes into this case. So not bad. We're almost done with this case. We just 
preventing, um, you know, trying to prevent complications that's going to prolong the case. I but think this is the most crucial part of the case, like you said, to prevent any further issues or complications because if we mess up air and distally embolize on that single or one and a half vessel runoff, then we are chasing that target all the way down to distal PT and it just becomes a, a, a harrowing experience. So I guess these steps are important for one to learn and to do it the right way to prevent further issues down the lane. So extra five minutes will save you an extra 50 minutes down. Oh, ex absolutely, Vishal. And I'm telling you, that little ballooning that we did up top is going to save us. And we're still getting stuck there, I'm sure. And now we're actually stuck getting stuck up top now, which is interesting, where we didn't get stuck before. I think it's just right? a little bit, yeah. There, there you go. So the other thing you can do, guys, put a syringe on this uh, end, please. OK, there it goes. Show me down. Mm -hmm. yeah, almost there. This time flew. Yeah. So now, oh. ah, there it is. There it goes. Okay, good. All right, give me some syringe with dye now. So now this is a very important step because it's going to tell you what you're dealing with in terms of vessels. Give me DSA. So, so this is first going to tell you how much plaque that you have in the in that filter and what's going on. So Elizabeth, I know, being such an excellent nurse, is preparing on iPride and everything. So I wow. want to show you this. Look at that. Say so all that is debris. That's the filter being overwhelmed. Okay? So now what I'm going to do is give me the penumbra. Right here. Turn it on, Damien, when I tell you. Turn it on, Damien. Okay. So it's now on. Now you'll see the suction, right? I'm just going to go, see, it's sucking it out. See the, the divide, everything disappearing? <laughs> see that? Let's put me on corner, please, quickly. So you can see we're aspirating it all out, right? Right. All out. Now, believe it or not, you're going to laugh at me? We're out of room here. Turn it off. <laughs> so, so, you know, it gets more interesting, right? Okay, give me a little more dye. Let's see how much we have. And now again, I'm going to go ahead and in inject. Now, Penumbra suction is phenomenal. I forgot my, my wonderful, wonderful rep. Yeah, DSA, please. Michael Ligori told me. It's got really very, very powerful suction, so you should be able to get this all out. You know, I wish my Medtronic rep was as good, but it happens. So, <laughs> so you know. Wow. See, that's a clear demonstration you know? of how important this is. Yeah, so let's turn it on again. Let's keep sucking here. So much so for that turn two to three micron debris which they claim. Yep. I just wish I could get down there a little bit more, which I can't. So I'm going to just do something which I normally don't do, which is bring the wire back and try to herky-jerk the filter forward. And I'm going to stop there, turn it off. Okay, give me some more dye. I'm just going to make sure that I now I'm going to do this on the suction so I can see something, degree of anything falling out here. Okay, so it's all within the filter. Give me the suction. Turn it on, please. It's on. Okay, this is not something we normally do, but I'm going to just, under aspiration, bring it back. And just, okay, give me a shinny, please. No dye. No dye. Yeah, it shouldn't be sucking now. Now I'm just going to leave this under suction, follow it up. <clears throat> so I have not lost wire position yet, Vishal. Yeah. So hopefully I don't. So I'm under full suction now, Vishal, sucking it out without, without losing it, hopefully. And then, you know, and the beauty is it's still on the wire if we need to, God forbid, pull it out again. Okay. We can let go. You can come off. So the question is now, is it inside my... No, it's just outside. I don't know if it's inside. It's probably inside my uh, sheath. 
watch that, see what is it in there or is it in the other side? Okay. So and sometimes it's stuck and sometimes it comes out at the sheet. See, it came out at the sheet there. Is it flush? I don't, so I think it's stuck inside my TUI now. It's, yeah. You, have you to see that? Yeah, I can see that. That's why I was going to say it's on Floro. See, yeah, it's still there. So it's inside my, my TUI. Oh, here it is. I got it here. Okay, I got it. Here it is. Take the filter out. Can we see the filter to see if we can? Well, I, I'm sure my everything hand. is sucked out probably. Hopefully. Now the important stuff is yeah, yeah. Okay. I want to bleed it back. You can see some grub there, but I'm sure most of it is sucked back into the system. Okay, guys, can you uh, uh, turn on the flush now? Flush, quickly. Flush. Okay, good. Turn it off. Okay, good. So now give me the, give me the um, put me on DSA. So the, the two other things I want you guys to look at is always if you follow pressure in the cath lab, look at the pressure. Make sure your pressure is okay. I don't know why this C arm is not moving. There it is. Okay. Now Liz is going to give me some nipride. Give me some nipride, please. Nice. Very good. Give me 50 mics of nipride. So we're going to flush some nipride in through the sheet. It seems that you're working very hard on the zero gravity that you were not working before, so. <laughs> <laughs> should be easier, I Flush. thought. Well, you know what happens is that Elizabeth rigs it, rigs it so I, uh, I work extra hard. I don't know. She makes all these noises. So, all right. Ready to take a picture, guys? So all we it's care about right now is our distal vessel. Correct. So all I care about, I think approximately we're well under control. Question is, did we screw up anything distally? And let's see what the flow is here, and this will tell us in a second. Ready? Mm -hmm. Very nice. Right? Very this nice. Is, you know, this is what you know, we teach, right? We do this every day, you and me here. This is what the fellows teach. Can you fix my zero gravity here, guys? <laughs> what way? There you go. Good job, Liz. Thank you, Liz. You should be air traffic controller. Ready? <laughs> she had the orange things waving through, Vishal. Look at that. Very nice. Now, Vishal, we've now done atherectomy. We've now aspirated. We've ballooned angioplasty. We have Timmy 3 flow. We have all the vessels. What's your definitive therapy, sir? Well, for me personally, totally looking at this, I, I would, if you really want to go by the data, I would probably end up doing a supera stenting there. Focally, you, but I, I would definitely, in this case, keeping in mind the long, significant circumferential calcification, I would, I'm a big proponent of supera in this case. With or without drugs, sir? So now, now this is another question. Like you said, there are no head-to-head -head trials, so nobody really knows whether you want to do with or without the drug, the concept or the, the thought process is you want the drug to work as well in addition to the good uh, vascular mimetic uh, stature of Supera. So I'm, even though it might be off level, I would probably do a DCB, layer the whole thing up, up and down, and just do a focal Supera in the mid tightest segment where we had it and hopefully get out. Choice of DCB and why, sir? Well, again, uh, if you really want to- I mean, assuming, assuming Starrex is available, Okay, so just say right now you have all three DCBs available. Choice of DCB. Well, again, if you really look at the uh, significant calcification, there's, everything is like a subset analysis, which we, we know that when we do well, subset analysis. Well, uh, yeah, no, well, yeah. I mean, right. it had a higher percentage, but Correct. it wasn't powered to look at calcium. Exactly. So that's what I was going to say. Like, all these subset analysis are not always powered to look at Agreed. what it is. They give a direction. So if I had Stellarex, I'll go for that. Otherwise, my next option would be an impact uh, uh, DCB. And I'm going to ask you this question and you don't have to answer it. Uh, do you think that one DCB is superior to the other? Uh, not really. Good. Because I think that's the misnomer that we need yes. to put aside. Correct. There are some companies that walk around talking about their data saying that their data is better than the other and some companies that walk around saying that their, their device is safe, more safe than the other. 
the actual the, the actual facts, and I think that's what you and I always try to speak, is that uh, the actual facts is that there is no safety signal in a drug-coated balloon as of yet. All the drug-coated balloons are safe. And the only one thing that we can say about DCBs is all DCBs work better than, calc uh, better than PTA at one year. Correct. And that the impact balloon is the only DCB that has out to three-year data and soon to be five-year data showing superiority over PTA. I think other than that, everything else is marketing spin. I encourage all the interventionalist vascular surgeons and vascular medicine people to understand, and I think you agree with me, in that that this is not, that impact is better than Lutonix, or Lutonix is better than impact, or impact is not safe, or Lutonix is safe. That this is all misnomers. Just like saying that one particular DCB is better in calcium than the other, I think the fact is that this balloon has a higher preponderance of calcium, the Stellarex balloon, with, with the fact that the Stellarex um, you know, is, 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 has a different definition of, of what is defined as severe calcium. Not that it's right or worse or better, it's just the facts. So please, you know, base your, your, your best clinical practices based on these facts rather than these marketing gimmicks. So now having said all that, okay, so you're saying definitive AR, you, you, like, you like the definitive AR uh, kind of signal. Yes. Uh, the, the reality signal, Shamus is... Uh, um, uh, you know, atherectomy plus DCB signal, so you're going to go with the DCB. So in this case, I am going to use an imp impact DCB uh, based on just the fact that uh, at this stage, you know, my, with my experience with impact has been positive as it has been with other DCBs. So I'm going to use the impact. Give me a 60150 uh, balloon, please. Impact balloon. I'm going to use uh, two 150s, cover the, cover the whole thing. And then the other question now is you said Supera. Well, I would probably and, and I want to ask you why Supera and why not Zilver? Don't open the impact yet. I'm well, gonna, I, I'm gonna I hear guess what he has to say. if again, like I said, I'm not doing a head-to-head -head comparison. It's just purely data on calcification. And if you see the patency rate in Supera at one year, two, and three years, it's actually better patency with calcified lesions in Supera. So I, my my whole thought process would be try to after DCB try to see if I can just do focal stenting if it needs to be, especially at that significant calcification at 26 where you are having issues even post atherectomy uh, to get your guide down. So uh, DCB with the focal stenting is what I would probably end up with in this case. So 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 my my, my thing is I want to get rid of some of the misnomers with uh, Supera and Zilver. So first and foremost, there's no head to head data. Correct. Okay, that's first thing. Second is the fact that what's important to remember is that the Zilba fracture rate stabilize at 1.9% in their IDE trial after three years and don't get worse. So it's a very low fracture rate. Third is, third is Zilber has randomized control data where Supera doesn't. Okay, fourth is Zilber has a biologic therapy where Supera doesn't. The advantage of Supera in these cases is that obviously the, uh, uh, when you have a worry about expans uh, expansion and, go ahead, pull it up, and, and prevention of um, uh, stent compression, I really think I agree with you there, Vishal. I think that Supera uh, ha has a superiority over there over right. Zilver. So if you're, if you're planning on using drug-coated balloon and spot stenting, then I think you're, you're totally reasonable in using a drug-coated balloon and a Supera. If you're planning on using a full metal jacket, however, I do, I'm not certain that, that the Supera data has enough strength on its own for you to say that, yes, I believe that, you know, in this this type of lesion subsets, let's go ahead and just use a standalone Supera. I think in that case, I would probably defer to the Zilver Pass study and at least say I have some patency data, um, although it's not randomized to balloon, it's randomized to surgery, to show that the Zilver Pass has patency in these long lesions. Uh, that's uh, at least in a randomized control study. So, you know, it's very hard to make these decisions, and I think that's why we present these cases in a, in a webinar. Um, so that we can discuss these, uh, these, these indications openly and clinically to really discuss. So this is a 6-0, impact. I'm going to have him go really, really high pressure here. Yeah. I'm going to go to like 10 or 12 or even 14. Turn on the timer, Damien. And, and I guess the biggest issue is the superiority of Supera is all dependent on the deployment. If you deploy it in an 14. optimal segment with the optimal length, then the data is very supportive. But if you start going longer or if you start compacting, the data starts to go haywire. And so that's where the technical issue of Supera comes into play and that affects your patent, clinical patency down the lane. So You know, you know, as, as interventionalists, we're, we're challenged because, you know, whether you're vascular interventionalist or vascular surgeon or cardiac interventionalist, you know, you, 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 the, the marketing machine that's out there, which is phenomenal, and all intentions are good in, in terms of putting the patient forward, when, they, when the marketing machines start to compare trials and say one is better than right. the other, 
Yeah, I think you, you as a clinician have to be skeptical on and ask for what the data is available head to head. And I think we've illustrated that here. I think, I think you know, once uh, hopefully we start seeing some randomized control trials like we did in the coronary space, which looks at Zions versus, uh, you know, Boston's uh, taxes and taxes versus Cypher and, so, and Medtronic stent versus the Abbott stent. It doesn't really matter. The whole point I'm trying to say is at least then you can have some clarity to say that one's better than the other. Uh, you know, the problem is right now is that there is no motivation uh, for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for the companies to sponsor such trials. And obviously, if one is better than the other, it, it, it's, it's going to be create, a, create a major issue. Now, I do want to congratulate Boston Scientific, because as you know, in the, in, the, uh, in, the major, in the Imperial trial, they put the Silver PTX up against their uh, Luvia drug loading yeah. stent, which, which we will know very, very well soon, uh, you know, what's going to be the results of that. I, I, I know that their Ranger IDE is underway. I, I don't know whether they have plans to put the Ranger balloon up against Lutonix or against Met Metronics Impact, but that would be very, very interesting. But I think we need to start having this sort of data, Supera versus Silver, Silver versus Alluvia, Alluvia versus Supera, uh, to try to figure out what is the best therapy for us uh, to treat these patients. That's all. So as we're watching the paint dry, tell me about uh, your weekend or how, how was your weekend and, uh, no? Nope. Yeah, I'm asking Sandeep, Sandeep went to see his family. There's no weekend. There's Liz no just came back from Bermuda. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was yeah. Two weeks ago? Okay. All right. So um, let me see, we're almost, how often, so let's talk about duration of DCB. What is your, what is your, what is the optimal duration of DCB inflation? What is your practice, and also the duration of antiplatelet therapy with DCB? Well, I mean, for me, the DCB, we technically, again, you and me differ on this, and we've probably had this uh, so-called conversation before, but I usually go for DCBs One at least three months DCB. of Plavix. I mean, One dual antiplatelet therapy, whether it be One aspirin, Plavix, or whatever the patient is on, and then, of course, reevaluate by doing a follow-up ultrasound. So I'm a little bit more aggressive on the antiplatelet form, even though there is no real data to suggest three months versus one month versus six months, but it's, it's just probably my clinical practice where I go three months of dual antiplatelet therapy, especially in DCB patients. Well, as uh, you know, as you know, that, that's been, you can walk it out, as you know, that's been controversial, and one right. of the things that, that I think that you and I also discussed is this phenomenon of DCB thrombosis, right? And, right. Um, and the worry here is, you know, what are we doing with that and how are we dealing with that? So, you know, uh, Plavix resistance in DCB, uh, at least in our high volume practice, is starting to have a little bit of an impact. And I think, uh, you know, you know we've, we're gonna look at our data uh, with DCB thrombosis and look at our Plavix resistance in those patients. Um, so, it, you know, we have a lot of this issue uh, with these particular patients with DCB thrombosis, and we've had uh, the PRUs on all these patients, which is very, very interesting. Um, and also the other, the other thing is also long lesion DCB with thrombosis, you know what I mean? Uh, the, um, the long lesions uh, with, with poor runoff, although in the registry there, there have not been any safety signals or, or I should say complications such as thrombosis reported, the question is whether or not that's, uh, that's a reality in, in all these patients. You know that in the impact, and I just want to go over this on the differences between the trials. Can you go to coronary, please? Uh, the differences between the trials. The impact um, had a subset that was analyzed uh, by ultrasound, uh, uh, meaning the registry, the global registry, that was analyzed by ultrasound and also had both the clinical events committee, an ultrasound core lab, and an angiographic core lab. Uh, the, uh, the Lutonix registry was all self-reported data, uh, had no core lab adjudication, okay? So, so, so the issue here is when you look at this data, what is it, how do you make your clinical decisions? Based on what, you know? Based on what do you make your clinical decisions? So, so if, if, if you're saying that there's no thrombosis occurring in the real world registries on these long lesions, can you really say that? Because if you look at the Lutonix data, it's self-reported, maybe it wasn't reported, maybe it was reported. If you look at the impact, maybe in their subset of 200 patients, they didn't have thrombosis, but they still occur in the real world. So it, that's good, go to 14, yep. So, so I think that that's good right there. So I think that we have to start looking at this a little bit more objectively in our own practices, see what it is that we're seeing, and then, and then report it. In the Stellarex uh, registry, global, is it Brady? No. In the Stellarex uh, global registry, I, I, I think that uh, you know, all the patients are gonna be followed 
uh, with the uh, ultrasound and the CEC, but however, the numbers of patients are low again. So I'm telling you, I, I think there is a, well, something that we're missing out there with these thrombotic lesions that are coming back as occlusions. Some may present a critical limb, some may not because of their claudication population with a robust profunda with good vessel runoff. Unlike covered stents, we're not, we're not closing the collaterals, so the collaterals may, may keep this patient as a claudic and albeit may be worse in their Rutherford class. So I think that the antiplatelet issue is going to become a big deal. Uh, PRU testing is going to become even more of a big deal as these drug-coded uh, technologies become more mainstream. So in, in our practice currently, at least in my practice, we, we have now decided to increase and follow what we call as the Kapoor protocol uh, to, to, to increase the, the, the dur duration of antiplatelet therapy out to three to six months depending on the patient. Um, and, uh, and the question is now that I think you and I have to discuss is whether we want to do PRUs on these long segment DCBs just to get a baseline on where these patients are before discharge. We know in the coronary, I forgot the name of that study. What was the study that looked at uh, at Scar Scar Fellows who have to write their boards? What was the name Gra of that stu study? Huh? Uh, the was it Veritas? Gravitas. Yeah. Gravitas. No, gravitas. was it Gravitas? I can't oh. remember. The platelet thing. No, they looked at PRU whether it was effective in yeah, checking. Gravitas. Yeah, Gravitas. It was, uh, so it was Gravitas. So, so when you look at Gravitas, we know that it showed no benefit in, in, in checking um, antiplatelet therapy, whether they were resistant or not with Plavix in terms of adverse outcomes. So I'm not saying that we need a head-to-head -head here. I think we just need to figure out whether there's a role for such a thing here. What time, how much time? Uh, two, two minutes, 10 seconds. Go ahead, Prashal. No, so more? I guess the next question is, one what's no? after your DCB, uh, what's yeah. your next uh, 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 treatment of length? choice or what's the next step? What are you thinking? Length. What's no, that? No, no, no. Saying after your DCB, I just want to know what your thought process is. What, how do you decide on what's your next step is? What's your yep. algorithm yeah, in your mind? Yeah, we covered it. Yeah. So, so what, what I'm going to do now is take a picture. And, um, and like you said, our, our algorithm now has moved from, uh, from uh, DES to Supera if we need to. And, and the issue now becomes is whether or not we need to stand. I may, if I have a, an adequate DCB result, I may just leave this with atherectomy DCB. Uh, if, not, if not, I will go with, uh, with the Supera. So I guess following up in the Supera stuff, I remember we nope. discussing at the Mount Sinai Link conference with especially Dr. Walker talking okay. about Supera sizing when you've Negative. already used a DCB. Yeah. Do you want to Negative. comment on that part? Yeah, well, it was actually it was actually Dr. Zeller who bought oh, that. Oh, sorry. Up. Yes. Dr. Yeah. So Zeller. so right. uh, Craig uh, unfortunately couldn't make our meeting this year, but but Tom brought up the fact that you may have some positive remodeling and we need to size the Supera higher, so uh, meaning a larger size than we would normally use. I mean. Honestly, we have not seen that in our practice, Vishal. I don't think you've told me about a patient that you, of yours right. that had a migration of the supera because of a positive remodeling of the vessel and malapposition of the supera. So therefore, I'm not concerned about that. I haven't seen it myself. Um, and, and you know, our volume is not minuscule. So if anything, we would see it. So I tend to kind of uh, wait. On, I'm a wait and see on that approach. I still follow the recommendations given to us by uh, Abbott and, um, and our experience to decide which is the way to do it. So now we just inject it, hopefully we have flow. And the flow is there, not as good, so meaning that we embolized. Yep, we definitely embolized. Oh, I Again, guess balloon angioplasty itself embolizes, guys, as you can see right now. See what's happening? All right, give me some nipari, guys. We'll just, so usually yeah. there's a microvascular type embolization, um, but you know, it's gonna be there. And I will show you, as you see, the flow is not the best, as you can see. So we're going to go ahead and give some nipride, flush it down, and then, is that nipride? Mm -hmm. 50 mics. Some give me another 50, Liz. Some verapamil, some nipride, flush. and then... We'll no, it's, it's bradycardic oh, okay, to begin with. Oh, okay, I didn't know the heart rate. Okay, great. Give me, just keep flushing. So we use, uh, again, um, you know, nipride is something that we use very commonly in the lab. Um, and I think uh, all of you out there should start using um, some, uh, some agents from the coronary world, uh, nipride. We don't use any papaverin whatsoever. Uh, so nipride seems to be what we will do. So we're an hour and 20 minutes in, which is not bad for a long, complex case um, with a lot of yapping, especially Liz was yapping the whole case. And now we will now start again. Hopefully we'll be done with this in a second. And uh, you know, the final parts of it are not as important flush. Just want to make sure we got good flow and no embolization, and I can even let you know what we're going, what we'll do at the end, and why we'll do it. So now we're flushing it through violently, 
-hmm. waiting for a change in our flush and key flush English. So again, this is important because you remember the old SVG days in the coronaries when you used to have plugging, and vigorous flushing always helped us as well. Um, so therefore, I think this is another thing because the microvasculature is so poor in these vessels that you clearly want to, you know, flush flush everything through. And so now that we've flushed a lot, lot of stuff through, let's take a picture now. Much, yeah, it's always preparing, like you said, beautiful. Much better flow, right? Much, much, much better. better. Flow. Yes. And uh, truthfully, you can you can argue with me to leave this alone. Say, PK, you know, let's just leave this alone, man. I want to see what's happening proximally first. Yeah, I'm going to take a better picture. You're absolutely right. Very nice. Yep. We keep the flow down to the yep, foot. The foot is the good, right? Point. So now yeah. we're happy with that. And I think that's a good illustration for you of the fact that drug-coated balloons do embolize. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, not drug-coated PTS. balloons. PTS. No, angioplasty does right. embolize. So, you know, when you had this microvascular debris that went out after you did the angioplasty. So there is, yeah. So the question here is, do you super it? And I think the answer is probably yes. Yes. So give me a, a so what now, the question is, what size super do you use? Give me a five. Five. What, what do you use? Five five? Five five. Give me a five five one fifty super, please. Would you would you do a six oh Dorado first? Just exactly. To, I give didn't a, I would not go to regular somewhere. Yeah. Six oh one twenty Dorado. Yeah, I'm I'm a little obsessive about preparing a lesion with Supera for good deployment. Just crack it up and then put a Supera in. Especially when you see there is still some residual stenosis right there at two focal spots. You can open it. What Dorados do you have? 60100 Dorado is fine. So I, I still agree with you, Vishal, that I think the flow is not very laminar here. Uh, and I, th I think clearly this is going to need one more step. Yes, it's going to need one, one step. So I think this is going to need the balloon supera. So, you know, I mean, I think right now we're at, we are at 30. I think everybody knows that we've gone over super deployment, Dorado and play inflation. I think we've talked about everything. So, so I think uh, if you're, it's okay with you, Vishal, I think we rather than show the final super deployment, um, we'll just go ahead and close here. Or you think we should just wait a few minutes and just show the whole thing? No, I mean we can quickly. just wait. Okay. Yeah, it, will, it, yeah, it won't it. take much long. We just Dorado and a super deployment. Okay. Final Good. Real, please. Yep. So now, the, now, the, now, remember geographically, we went up to. Almost nine on the uh, on the uh, with with the DCB. Correct. So all this is area that's been covered. But I think I'm gonna I'm gonna just deploy from here from five. So go up, please. High pressure. I'm gonna deploy from five, and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna balloon this segment because this is the segment that gave us the most trouble. Right. And I think this is the segment why the flow is not the best. Negative. Go up again. And I think this extra step that Vishal really very is encouraging me to do, and I agree with him, is gonna help this vessel stay open in the long run. Go, keep going. Crank it. 14, 16, there. 18, yeah. 18, 20. I'm not even happy with this expansion. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's still better. I see at 27, there's a very slight. I mean, that's just being obsessive. But I think it's still open up. Super, I will do a good job there. I hope 20. so. But, but remember, we're using a 5.5, five, so maybe we should go with the 7.0 Dorado down. Give me a 7.0 Dorado, guys, here. So this is the kind of prep that I want all you guys to think about. Go up here. So, you know, so this is not something that, you know, you want to say to yourself, oh, let me just deploy the Supera here. Exactly. I'll, be, I'll be happy. See that area right there? Yep. Not it's expanding. The you know, it's expanding, but it's not, not expanding really well. Go to 20. So this is a 20. Uh, 18. 18, 19, 20. 20. Huh? 20. 20. Okay, down. You have a 7-0? What do you have 7-0? Walk it back. So now we're going to go with a 7, which is really overkill. 7.0150. So this is obviously going to be a big deal for us to go with a 7. Uh -huh. You got it? I want to make sure the wire didn't move. Just push the wire. Okay, good. So now, again, again, like I think you stated so eloquently, Vishal, the, uh, 
the the thing here is you want the you want this vessel to be prepared. Right. So the seven O, yes, it's an extra step, but you will not regret it when you deploy that Sapera. So now now Lizzie knows this patient's gonna have a lot of pain. I know, but that's because of the wonderful uh, sedation that you've given him. But with this, he's, he's going to have a lot of pain. What's that? Uh, one second, one second. Yeah. You got it? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. So now we're going to go to five again. Okay, go up here. Okay. This is a 70150. Yeah. Ready? Go up. Crank it. Eight, ten. Yeah, it's just that a little bit. Yeah, oh. now it's it's still no. better. That eccentric 18. calcification was that's what's causing your luminance to just go down. 14. But here it looks better. 16. 18. 18. 20. Yeah. That's a 7-0 at 20 atmospheres. Wow. Is the shot. Just for everybody to know that we really mean pre-dilate. We really mean pre-dilate. Down. I'm just going to pull this back and pre-dilate up to 15 just because I think this is definitely going to make a difference for us in terms of luminal gain as well. Okay, this way we're not going to have any deep. Go ahead. Go to 20 atmospheres. Twenty. Yep. That's beautiful. I think this is really looks better now. Yes, Michelle. definitely. I'm a little happier with this down. So now we're gonna get the supera ready. So when you supera, you want to flush both bolts. lumens, like we flush, always talk about. You want to go ahead and do uh, uh, what is it called? The uh, the wiping of the shaft very very clearly, right? And then you want to you want to go ahead and have the wire distal again. So which I'm gonna now place my wire, which has come back. I'm just going to try to get a C-loop and get a distal for myself to make me happy. So that should be okay. Leave it right there. I think it'll be fine. I think it'll be fine, yeah. And you want to walk this Dorado out on a negative so that it's going to come out on a negative. Let's go one more time. This is a very bulky balloon, so it's the Kevlar balloon, unlike that first balloon we went with. Walk it out, guys. Mm -hmm. Show me the distal wire. Again, I pull the wire, getting it back here. Get my C loop. Take a good distal. Wonderful. Now we're going to go in with the Supera to 15. Again, the Supera deployment. I know a lot of people are doing a much better job of it now. Clearly, you want to go at 50. You want to go uh, high mag. You would like to have the Supera. Uh, what is it called? Placed in the area that you want to start. Really flare it, pull it back to the area of where you want to begin, and then start again. Wet rag, <coughs> straight in, wet the shaft nicely. Show me up top at five. So we're coming down with the Supera to five. Great. Wet rag, please. I mean, uh, show me uh, the um, coronary. Uh -huh. Mag up high. Coronary, uh -huh. please. Coronary. Mag it up high. Are you on floor? One second. Yep. And it's mag 32. You want more? Yeah, this is good. Get it off the bone for me. Thank you. That's good. I'm gonna I come would down. mag it up higher. Mag it up higher for me? Go 16 mag. 16? Yeah. Look. 16 mag. Good. Show Better. me more. Now you can see. That's perfect. I think that's good, Vishal. Yeah, I think that's perfect placement. So you can nicely see those dots aligned next to the stent, and that's where the real marker is that you're having uh, perfect alignment, not too much elongation, not too much uh, compression. Yep. If it's compressed, you see a line. Here you see, like, dots. 
and of course if you elongate you don't see much of those dense dots on the side so i think this is a great demonstration of how Shadow the superior should be there And again, the real player is essentially prepping that vessel up. So it's prepped up so well that the supera really be, has its true property of vascular mimetic nature. So it will take the, the lumen. Singla, you want to keep feeding the wire a little bit because the wire is going to come back. Nice. Yeah, look at the degree of calcification, brother. It's amazing. I'm just stacking it a little bit here. Yeah, I know. That's also one of these uh, techniques we usually use when there's a lot of calcification. You want to stack it to give it a little bit more of a radial strength to keep the stent open. A little bit of stacking there, but it's good. Stack, but it's okay. Beautiful. Wow, that's one of the fastest superiors I've ever seen PK deploy. <laughs> <laughs> Watch the walk to that, guys. Whoa, walk it up. Because you didn't close enough. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Okay. Nice. See how beautifully the dots are aligned? It looks that's great. That's good. That looks good. Okay, DSA. Mm -hmm. One second. Nice. Okay, ready? See? Okay, now give me a 60150 uh, power cross again. Actually, give me the 70 Dorado. It looks beautiful. The same one? The same one. Actually, give me a new one. Do you have a long 70100? Because these balloons, I'm telling you, once they deploy, yeah. they just uh, they just are so horrible. Give me a give me a 70100 Abbott uh, uh, Abbott Armada. Armada. 035. So now I, I just think now this is something I do right now just to align the struts a little bit better. I'm just everything looks really good. I'm gonna balloon this with a 70. Do you have the Armada? 70100. So with that, Vishal, I, I think we, we should close. Yes. Obviously, we deployed the Supera. We're just gonna post dilate. It took us an hour and a half to do this pretty complex case. You know, atherectomy, aspiration, Supera, the whole thing. I think maybe you can give some closing comments, and then we'll August uh, give them the date. And I think we'll see you back in August, guys. I hope this was useful. Awesome. Great. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, PK, for a great presentation. I hope you guys took some uh, learning points from there. Especially maybe you the could also uh, uh, overview a little bit on the steps for me, so the, for the conclusion of this, so they can get some take-home points. Right. So, again, following up on what uh, PK has shown us today, it's just... For the most important step, I guess, in this case is assessing the calcification, the degree of calcification and the runoff. And because that's where all your thought process of what your Sorry. steps in management of these patients will arise, starting from using a filter or not using a filter, and then going on the next step of what's your treatment strategy or what are we looking at? Do we need to do an atherectomy with DCP, atherectomy with DCB and stenting, or the other combinations? So, in, so assessing calcification, the extent and degree, and the, and the length of lesion, you can determine if you want to uh, take one atherectomy device versus the other, like he rightly showed in this case. Because of the dense calcification, we ended up using the jet stream pathway to help modify the plaque and the vessel side itself. And then following up this after atherectomy, you always should ascertain how the distal flow is because that's where our main concern is, the distal embolization, preserving the flow to the foot and the calf muscles, thereby relieving symptoms. So in this case, like we, he rightly showed to you, assessing the degree of uh, filter uh, use and how to take the filter out under controlled environment with the wire still being there is, the, I guess, the most important takeaway point I would take from this presentation. And then once we have the filter come back, to decide, like uh, PK discussed the data of various DCBs, 
and TES, and PTS, and bare metal stenting is your treatment strategy. What is available, what's correct for the patient, and what are you comfortable with, especially using a Supera and other technology. So once you decide on how you want to use the technology, we go ahead and like in this case, we did a, a drug-coated uh, drug uh, balloon which to layer up the hole to give a biological response to the vessel, and then we ended up having some residual lesions which we are not happy about and because we did so much hard work and we want good patency, ended up doing a focal stenting. Now in the stenting aspect, like PK was, and the team was discussing using a Zilver versus Supera, you could go for one or the other and just looking at the data, we, we, we leaned over the su, uh, Supera stent and then the technique of getting Supera in. Preparing the vessel when is the most important technique in doing Supera. If you have good vessel preparation and good expansion, your Supera deployment will be great and thereby translate into good clinical patency. And that's how it clearly showed how the patency part is. And then of course, following up these patients, using of dual antiplatelet therapy, what your protocol might be, one month versus three months versus six months, how you want to take it, or using additional testing such as PRU, which is not really approved, but again, it's all a protocol which you have to follow and follow the patient clinically. We usually in our lab follow up patients by doing routine ultrasounds in one month and then again in six months and one year, and of course clinically follow them. So I hope you, uh, you take away some great points from this presentation and the case itself. The complexity of the case and the treatment and the management thought process uh, helps you guide through this. So thank you again very much for joining us on this live presentation from Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. Uh, we'll be back next month, August 23rd, again, 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time for another great case presentation. You can go to our website, peripheralinterventions.org, to see these live cases in the archive session, this one at the end of the week, and any previous cases you might want to watch. Please email us to leave any comments, suggestions, questions, concerns, happiness, or, or anything whatsoever you might, so that we can, what we can improve, what we can show, or what we do you would like us to show in the future. Uh, we again thank you for uh, logging on, and we'll see you next month. Until then, have a great day and a week.